Mr. Jonah Coleman, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I, I, you know, I'm a little worried for those people watching this on YouTube. They might think we phoned each other this morning to make sure we matched. The phone. <laughs> yeah, it was yesterday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you mean uh, we're both wearing the same clothes as yesterday, or do you mean? Uh... No, we talked yesterday. <laughs> I wouldn't want them to think we talked today. Yeah. Hey, thanks for being on the show. People who listen to the show uh, have heard your past episode when we talk about software for growing shop. But for those who haven't, who this may be their first episode they're listening to, can you tell us who the heck are you and why are you talking talking to the world of cabinet makers? Yeah. So uh, I've been in architectural woodworking for 15 years now. I have a background as a, as a computer programmer, as a hobbyist programmer, uh, but I was always an engineering nerd. So I kind of grew up through woodworking uh, with my hands getting dirty, a lot of engineering, a lot of project management. I ended up working, you know, from for residential companies, for commercial companies. I really prefer commercial. You guys can keep the residential stuff. <laughs> and uh, I ended up doing a lot of consulting. I worked for Energy, the ERP company, because in my past I had actually written an ERP. Oh. I still maintain an ERP that's used by a dozen plus companies. Oh wow! I'm cool. kind of known as an engineering software nerd, so I'm I'm deep into Cam Division, Microvellum, Woodcad Cam a little bit. So you know this stuff. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. And you were at Energy. For people who don't know that, that's another. Can you give yeah. us two seconds on what an Energy is, because it, people might think it's spelled like electrical current energy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I N N E R G Y. I ended up. I was. I worked for the woodworking operation that owns that company. I was the operations manager, yeah. and so I had my hands pretty deep in with that crew because of my programming background. And I still do some consulting for them on some some things that I created for them. Um, it's funny you brought up the name. About three years back, we went yeah. to an energy meeting in Texas, and there were two halls side by side. And one said energy, I-N-N-E-R-G-Y. And the next one over was an energy conference because it's Texas. Oh, and those guys were all kind of like, look at those morons. They can't spell. <laughs> but they've got better, but they've got a better snack table. So let's wander over there and see oh, what's going on. And it's fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Hey, the, thank you for the, uh, the background for people who haven't heard about you or listened to your previous episodes here. The question I have, and this really came came from, you know, viewer mail, as David Letterman would say. After your last episode, I got a lot of feedback. I get people asking questions. And the basic... Like, what do you think of bringing this guy on? Yeah, what the heck? <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about. I think they were referring to me, but my ego doesn't let me hear that. No, no, no. The, uh, the question that came up was, and I boiled it down from multiple different questions, and thank you to people who do send questions in, but basically was, I'm done with estimating in Excel. What do I do next? Because people have built these beautiful flowering branch trees of Excel, but they also realize at a certain point, there's a lot of risk and it feels yeah. very top heavy or it, it's, it's not stable. And, and at the same time, they're afraid to move to a new system because what if it's not right? What if it doesn't work? So I call those spreadsheets from hell. <laughs> Spreadsheets from hell. That might be the topic here. Spreadsheets from That's hell. That's right. Yeah. So what do you do in that case? You're a you're a growing cabinet shop. You realize Excel's not going to get you to where you want to get to next. Walk me through how we you and I, let's say you and I were business partners and we started or maybe bought an existing shop that was using Excel. What would you guide what would you do to guide me through the next level? Yeah. So I'm I'm going to start in the exact same place I start with the ERP conversation or engineering or anything, which is what is your pain point, right? We don't want to change things just to change them. Churn is not good. Improvement right. is good. So if I came into a company that was selling like crazy and making lots of money on it, so they're selling for the right price, uh, I'm not horribly worried about them estimating with a spreadsheet just as its own problem. Does that make sense? Well, that's interesting. I'm going to prioritize some yeah. other problem. Now, as soon as we get to a point where we say, okay, because I'm a big theory of constraints guy, right? Yeah. So if estimating is not the bottleneck, an improvement made at a non-bottleneck is illusory. Illusory? So, 
Did it's you illusion. Say illusion? Yeah. <laughs> illusion. Oh, uh, illusion. Okay. Yeah. 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 You're not improving anything. You're just improving. You know, all that's going to happen is they're going to generate more than the following. You're just shining an apple. That's all you're yeah. doing. Yeah. Once we've decided that there's a problem with estimating, you know, what, what problems could there be? Well, the problems, uh, I'm not so worried about software for software's sake, if that makes sense. I want to know yeah. how it fits into what does the company do? So are we residential? Are we commercial? Because those are kind of different beasts when it comes to estimating. Yeah. If we are residential, do we sell primarily to builders and, and have that workflow? Or are we sending out designers to people's houses to sit down and design? Right. Right. Because if so, it leads you to different places. If someone's going to be sitting in front of a customer pricing something, they need to be able to click a button and say, here's the price in cherry. Oh, you, you wanted it in oak? Here's the price in oak. Yeah. Right? And relatively quickly. And then upsells, like give me a lazy Susan in the corner or cut back uh -huh. that cabinet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, if, if we're a commercial shop and we're doing architectural millwork, cabinets are just not a large portion of what we do. And so we're not going to pick a solution that's, that's aimed at that. Right? And so the problems you can have in estimating can be, are we getting to the right price? Mm. Right? Now, what does the software have to do with that? Well, there are shops out there that just take whatever price their estimating software gives them and they, that's what they go with. But that's not right. That's not how we set a price. Prices are set by what we know. You know, do we know that they have bids from five other contractors or do we know that they only come to us? Mm. Do we know that uh, last time the budget was 100000 or do we know that last time it was twenty? Do we know that this time what the budget is? Does that make sense? Yep. Now, some of those are process things that you can help with your estimating software. Because you can have software that asks those questions and, and standardizes that workflow so that everybody asks the same set of five questions. Right. Right? Um, so, so if... Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, so you and I now, we've bought this existing cabinet shop. It's doing great. It's running on Excel. Um, but Excel is causing us problems for some reason. Let's just say that Excel, that we feel that Excel is causing us problems. Price change orders, uh, managing changes, pre-production you know pre -production changes. That's what I, I think we're talking about here is pre-production changes. Is there a series of questions that you would guide us through, you know, with our own whiteboard or on a piece of paper to decide are we going with uh, estimating software A or software B, or let's go make this Excel everything we can possibly make it be? Add some more hell to the spreadsheet. Add more tabs. <laughs> if, if in, when in doubt, add tabs. When in more doubt, add colors. Yes, yes. No, I, I just want. want. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, again, we're going to start with what type of work do we do, right? Great. Now, Estimating software, you, you left out, a lot of people use their engineering software as estimating software in the residential design world, mm. right? They're going out in front of the customer with microvellum or cabinet vision or what have you, and it's generating a price for them right there. Right. And so that can be the right choice if that's the business you're in. Now, I would argue that if the business that you were in is high-end architectural commercial stuff, that is a terrible choice. <laughs> Because it takes too long, and it's and you're in more of a numbers game, right? And it also doesn't lend itself to the to the type of scope you're doing. So assuming that let's say we're a residential shop, right? right. Uh, how do we want to price? Well, who's doing the selling? Right? We got a salesperson, something like that, or a designer selling. Salesperson or designer or the owner? Because if I have if I have you know, some guy who can sell anyone anything and he's just sketching it out by hand and, and uh, typing it into a spreadsheet, how much do I want to try and teach him to use cabinet vision? Yeah, not his skill set. No. And I always say, this is, this is some truth to this, sales cures all, right? There's a chicken and egg problem with, with uh, sales and, and operations, but the chicken, you know, it's really not a chicken and egg problem for me. You got to have sales. Can't be at the wrong price, but you need to have. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna shut that guy down. I'm gonna figure out how to automate and help what he's doing. Now, uh, you know, you can get into some some. Mostly, you see the takeoff software and people who deal with um, either commercial or dealing with with uh, builders because they have a lot more standardization in their product set, right? It's generally the, the, the residential shops that are sending out people with design software 
and they need they need a lot of flexibility because you're dealing with an uneducated buyer who's changing their mind and and very non-standard set of products i mean uh it depends on where you are in the customization of your your cabinets but you know we get people who are doing one-offs that are never going to be done again in a million dollar house and uh, those people are going to use their design software and it's going to be fine they need to dial it in um, and again we're just estimating cost we're not estimating price that's something that people uh miss a lot because wow. the price is set by what you know cost is one input to that right so if i'm going to decide what price to sell something for i need to have a very good estimate of its cost but that's not the end of it that just sets the minimum price i would consider selling it for mm. is what it would cost me to make that's a very polite way of saying that jonah i was actually very eloquent the, well, the, I stole it from my old boss, Mark Sanderson. So, ah, uh, you know, Mark is Mark. At, by the time this goes live, Mark will have been on the show January, early January, talking about a, a banking issue. But yeah, uh, you know, estimating cost is different than estimating price. Cost right. is what you know, and I thought you were going to say price is what you can get. That's exactly but, what it is. That's <laughs> what all those things get to, right? It's how much can I charge? That's yeah. the price I should charge. Yeah, and. Uh, Depending on who you're working with, that can be more of an art than a science, but it doesn't need to be. You can boil it down to a number of questions and you can build those into your estimating software. I have a very, very nice uh, family cabinet shop that I'm working with and they're worried about the cost of putting uh, an estimating software in place because they feel they're carrying that cost themselves. Mm -hmm. And to me, it seems simple because I've seen it so many times, but I said, well, calculate how many jobs you're gonna do in a year. Just, just say 100 for the sake of this math. And if you're gonna pay $100 for software for the year, then charge every job you get $1 for software. You're not gonna lose a job, you're not gonna lose a $30,000 kitchen for charging $30,001. And so allocate the cost back to the client. It happens in so many places that we as consumers don't recognize. But it, you don't have to think as an owner that you're gonna bear this cost. This cost is borne by the market. You just have to understand when you're playing with your numbers, you can choose to take that out and eat it yourself, or you can choose mm -hmm. to get the customer to pay for it. Yeah. Now, I guess I would argue slightly off from you that if you can get $30,001, you should anyway. I think we're saying, yeah, I think we're saying yeah. the same thing. I just understand that that $1 is allocated to paying for the software. Whatever it's for, if that's how much they're willing to pay, ideally, that's how much we can get. Yeah. And so we need engineering or estimating software that gives us a good, and estimators, sorry, I'll take a step back. We need the software and the estimators who can give us a good estimate of what it will cost to produce this thing. Because if I can believe what you tell me, if you tell me it's going to cost $20,000 to produce, if I believe you that that's correct, I can make a good decision about what price to accept the work for, sure. giving, given how busy the shop is and the time of the year and what other opportunities I expect to come into play. But if I can't believe your price, then it's worthless, right? You're just doubling the work and increasing the stress. That's right. And so there are other functions that estimating software can play as well, because it's not good enough just to win the work, right? If we win the work at the right price, we still have to do the work. And that's actually the more important part. And so part of what a good estimating package does is help communicate what was sold. I mean, I've, I've worked long enough that as a project manager, I've been handed a project and I'm reading it through and I'm like, I literally don't understand what we sold this person. I have no <laughs> idea what the scope is, right? And so, again, I'm going to steal from my old boss. You'll probably hear this one when he's visiting with you. But uh, a lot of estimating departments have this attitude of I kill the cow, I throw it over the fence. Somebody else takes care of it. Yeah. Kill the cow, throw it over the fence. Kill the cow, throw it over the fence. And so that estimating software, if you're looking at on-screen takeoff type stuff, and, and even in residential, if you're working with builders, you can do on-screen takeoff on a set of builders plans, and then it's clear to everyone, what did we sell? Well, we sold that, it's right there on the screen. Right. And you miss that in a lot of Excel spreadsheets because you just get 10 linear feet of something at $75 a foot. And later on, people can often back into what you sold, but then it's not clear. It's, and that clarity can sometimes lead to problems, especially if you haven't been clear with the builder and they said, I thought you were going to do the crown moldings around the corner. And you say, we didn't budget for that, but 
You, no, as a PM, I say, I'm not sure. I can't tell. From the plan. Right? Yeah. And now I have to ask an estimator who doesn't remember. Because all I have is a spreadsheet that shows me 75 feet of $80 a foot. Yeah. Yeah. It, do you think we've gotten any closer to answering people's questions? I'm done with Excel. What do I do next? What I've yeah, heard so, so far is a branching tree. I have to understand if I'm residential and the multi-types are residential or from architectural millwork or custom furniture, whatever it might be, right? That's right. And, and it's hard to give just a straight answer to this because it just depends. And if you want me to just make up a straight answer, I'll give you one that applies to half of the people out there. And the other half of the people will think that I'm a moron because it so obviously doesn't apply to them, right? You notice I'm being quiet here. I'm rarely quiet, so go ahead. <laughs> I mean, again, it just depends who you are and what state, what level you're at. If you're if you're a fairly sophisticated operation, you're going to want a more sophisticated estimating package. Mm. If you're a non-sophisticated operation and you put in the most sophisticated package that there is, it's not going to do well for you. Too much gun for the so, bear. Yeah. So maybe we'll just make a scenario. We'll take your scenario and we'll make it more specific. Okay, we've got a mill workshop. It's, you know, 15 to 20 person on the shop for a mill workshop. Yeah. So we do maybe three to $4 million in revenue a year. Yeah. And we're making money, but not great. We're just making 5%, right? 4%. Yeah. And that's not enough to, to, to keep us excited as owners, right? Sure. So we figure out that this is a shop that is pretty effective at executing the work once they have it. They, they do a good job of project management. They do a good job of production. They're, they're somewhat modernized enough. Uh, and we really think that if we picked up another $2 million in work, that we could do it in this shop without having to add anything. Right. Maybe a few people on the shop floor. That's lucrative, right? Because we're going to keep a huge percentage of that $2 million. And so we think the only thing we need to do is we need to pick up more work. All right. So here's the question. Are we having enough opportunities come through as it stands that if we just want more of them, right, right, that, that we could get there? Yeah. Uh, probably not. I don't know. Well, if that is the case, yeah. then we're sitting at a point where we just need to figure out, all right, well, how do we capture more of them? And we ask some questions. I say, all right, do you guys bid everything, every opportunity that comes through? And when I ask people this, for some reason, every estimator wants to say, absolutely, we get to everything, right? But that's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. That means that you don't have a channel that's delivering you enough work that you can select the work that's good for you. Right. You got to be able to say, you need a bid yes, no checklist is what I call it. You got to be able to say no to some things. But you can't say no if you don't have enough work even flowing in the door. Then you say yes to everything. Yeah. So if you're, if you're at a point where your estimators say, absolutely, we get to everything that comes in the door, then there's a problem. And you need the problem doesn't lie with software at that point. The problem lies with finding a channel that can deliver you more of this work. Leads. Right? And but so let's say let me interrupt you for a second. This whole conversation is part of this whole podcast. It's leads. The the way we bring business into a company is we understand our lead flow. Mm -hmm. And we have a conversion rate, which is like a batting average, right? In front of 10 customers, I'll win three. That's my batting average. That gives me three customers. So mm -hmm. leads times a 30% conversion rate equals three customers. That's what you're talking about here, right? It is. And I'm going there when you ask me about software, because we don't do software for software's sake, right? We don't even do estimating for estimating's sake. If, so I'm an engineering nerd, and I tell people in engineering talks of this all the time. And it applies to estimating, but I can say it a little more authoritatively from engineering. Yeah. I love engineering, but if we could run our businesses without doing any of it, we totally would. It's not what we do. It's just something we do because we have to. Right. right? Yeah. So estimating is the same way. We don't do estimating because we love estimating, unless you're an estimating company, in which case I'm not talking to you. Yeah. Uh, we're woodworkers. And at the end of the day, what pays is product delivered to a job site. So the software we choose has to fit into what we do and why we do it. Mm. And so in our scenario, we're gonna assume that we do have a channel that delivers sufficient opportunities, right? And we're bottlenecked, we just can't bid them all. All right, this is a perfect place to be for software to help you, because we're automating. And all automating does is make what you currently do faster, yeah. whether it's right or wrong. It'll let you do wrong things faster too. 
Yeah, it's a magnifier. It'll just, yeah, it's like a big megaphone for whatever you're doing. Yeah. So in our case, we want to we wanna make sure what we're doing is right. So are we arriving at the right price now with our current model? Um, and the right price means the one that captures the most value we possibly can. Right? Not just one that covers our costs, but we need one that delivers a price that does cover our costs, but also uh, is competitive with the marketplace. Mm. Kind of make sense? Yeah. So if we ask and the estimators say, yeah, absolutely, our prices are good. We just literally can't bid everything that comes through. Perfect. Then we look at software. Um, you know, if, if it's design, if we have designers who are going out to a job site and hand sketching stuff and then coming back and putting it in a spreadsheet and coming up with a price, you know, and again, they should be coming up with a cost and then deciding on a price based on what they know, but put that aside. Then maybe that's the time where if they're technical enough, we teach them, you know, microvellum cabinet vision and they take a laptop with them and they design in front of the customer and they push a magic button and it tells them a price. Right. That's great for them. If we're in, a, in I'm gonna assume we're in the business here where like most of our business is builders, hardly any of it's walk-in stuff. Mm. And maybe we don't even like the walk-in stuff that we end up having to do just, just to do it, yeah. right? Well, that's perfect. We can, we can come up with uh, accurate estimates of our cost, which hopefully you have a job costing system and you can work backwards from that. And we can, I don't even care about the method. If you want to take off each cabinet or if you want to do lineal foot price or square foot price based from the, the front, the depth, whatever it is, uh, we'll put that in place. And so for us, we're going to look at some on-screen takeoff, right? It's builders and the builder workflow is similar to the architectural woodworking workflow where uh -huh. you get a set of drawings from someone. You have to estimate a price for it. They're going to change it a hundred times on you and they're going to ask you to break things out. And, and yep. what if I did, you know, um, they're going to consider breaking scope up between multiple suppliers. And so you have to be able to break your bid up, you know, which is a whole different conversation that you don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's where we are. That's the world we live in. And so what becomes important for us is making sure that whatever it is that we've sold, everyone knows. And that's where the, the on-screen software, like, you know, like a plan swift, right. Or energy does on-screen takeoff, which where I came from. There's yeah. on-screen takeoff is the name of the software, right? From Roger Shaw. Okay. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of them. But whatever it is, we're going to do that because it cuts down on the amount of duplicate work that happens later. Where uh, it also gives the opportunity to price things multiple ways and, and present, you know, break that data down as, as much as you have to. But again, we don't want to do that. Not if you don't have to. No, it's extra work and you could be being led down a path. Yeah, our, our customers are in no position to know what things cost us to make unless we tell them, right? Yeah. They have no idea. You're talking about a kitchen. What does a kitchen cost? Well, nobody has any basis of knowing that because no, they don't do two of them, you know, very many of them that are exactly the same. And the more they do exactly the same, the more they do have an idea what it should cost, which makes it a market that's less attractive for us, right? That's right. But if we break it down for them and tell them what every little piece costs, then we just shot ourselves in the foot. It is, it is a problem that a lot of, uh, of uh, people in cabinetry, uh, you know, I won't say architecture millwork because on the millwork side, that breakdown doesn't typically happen that same way. They right? do. They, they, uh, they, they don't want to. What's that? They try. Well, they, try. they try. They do. Yeah. But you don't want to go down that path. You may have an unqualified prospect. If you have a lot of people who are asking you to break down everything that you're doing in your price, then you actually need to go back to the top of your business operations and change how you're getting your leads. hundred percent. Fire that customer. Yep. Yeah. Hard to do. Nobody wants to hear us say that. And some of you are nodding your heads right now. That's exactly what has to be done. You've got to figure out how to be proactive in your marketing, not reactive. You can't just hope and pray for the phone to ring or emails to come in. You've got to actually go out to the market and look for the right customers. It's what we talk about on the show anyway, so everybody's heard me say this a gajillion times. Then you can start to think about some, some peripheral things that are similar to and part of estimating packages, but maybe not core to it, like document management. Hmm. A lot of the estimating packages will help you keep track of what is the current version of the document as it changes and right. how did we get here. I mean, we've all had plenty of jobs where at the end, we're like, how did we arrive at this price? And you got to, you know, play 20 questions with the project manager and say, okay, 
wait a minute, we started with 100,000 of this, and then we ended up taking this back and putting that on, and then taking this off and putting that on. Yeah. And somewhere in there, you forgot the price of change. <laughs> <laughs> We're laughing, but yeah, it's, it's basically a, a big block of Jenga. And you don't know when, when it's going to topple. And when it topples is when it starts to eat into the profit of the owner. You've added stuff. You've taken stuff away. You put stuff on top. You move the table. All of those things happen. Yeah. Change orders should be an opportunity to make some money. Because somebody's Absolutely. trying to change a fixed price contract on you. And, Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I used to have a little sign that was uh, right over there where you can't see that said, uh, make me sign a fixed price contract. You win. Want to change it? I win. Oh, say that again, Jonah. Make me sign a fixed priced contract. You win. Try to change it. I win. Nice. Make me sign a fixed price contract. Okay. I thought you were going to talk about the boat that uh, there's a meme that goes around of a boat called change orders. No, no, <laughs> not familiar with that. Yeah. I'm going to write this down. Make me sign a fixed price. contract. So um, I wonder if people listening to the show are just as frustrated as when they started saying, you haven't answered my question. I don't want to use Excel anymore for here's my nine reasons. Okay. And you come back and said, you're not asking the right question, my friend. First, separate yourself and understand what kind of residential or what kind of commercial fabricator are you? And then from there, start asking the right questions. What do you want the system to do? Okay. And then I have to go back to our last interview where you reminded us, don't try to get one software to do everything for you unless I suppose you have an ERP, but at that point you're a much higher revenue company, correct? Uh, no, there's, I'm trying to think of exactly how to answer that. The, um, I won't say don't try to get one software to do everything for you. I will say don't try to, to get something that's close uh, to do something it wasn't designed for just for the purposes of having one software, right? So pick the best tool for the job. And if that tool can do is a, is a multi-tool, okay. But if it's just kind of like, it's a drill, but I could also hammer with it if I wanted to, that's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. Uh, as far as the, you know, giving just a straight on answer, I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna say number one, uh, what finish should I put on my cabinets? Are, are you asking me? I'm just letting it linger for a minute. Okay. Because anyone who's an actual woodworker listening to this is going to go, I don't know, what are you doing with it? Right? And it's, it's very similar. You can't, you can't ask a question like that. The question's wrongly formed. What software should I use for X? The only people who will answer that directly are salespeople. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I don't think there's a lot of consideration that goes into this. But there's some. I mean, if you want me to just say use Plan Swift, okay. Uh, but it's not going to work well for half of the people listening. And so, uh, you know, we could do a couple of scenarios. I'm going to say we just gave the scenario, which is a residential, $3 million shop, just needs more work to come through, has enough opportunities walking the door. They just don't estimate fast enough. Yeah, Plan Swift, uh, Energy, on screen takeoff, those are all great for that workflow. You're a residential shop and you have designers who go out to the job site and they're, they're technical enough that you're not worried that they won't be able to do it. Um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with using your engineering software and landing at a price that way. In fact, that's perfect for you. Couldn't be better. Now, if you say, look, I really want to do something other than Excel, but my designers and, and estimators aren't capable. Well, that's a personnel problem and, and you have to decide. You know, if, if this is really something you have to change, then you have to change the thing that's in the way. And that's hard, very hard, yeah. but it's all there is. There's no other, there's no, there's no magic software that's going to come in that they'll be able to run. Right. So if you're a commercial shop, then you should definitely not do the engineering software thing. That's a terrible idea. And uh, I always like to say at this stage of the process, we're yeah. estimating, not actually right yeah. running it through your engineering software is too actual and it to be honest with you it just gives you a false sense of precision you know you get that number that's like thirty thousand two hundred and forty seven dollars and sixteen cents yeah it's a lie there's too much you don't know 
It feels very exact, but it's not. The precision is just hidden because it's not in the numbers. It's in the information that went into the numbers. This is on the commercial uh, side, Jonah, right? Yes. Yeah. Architectural, commercial, really builders probably shouldn't be doing a lot of design stuff because it will become a bottleneck real quick. That's, that's the real thing. Now, somebody wants to jump in and bid when you're too busy and they want to run it through their engineering software because that's what they know. Perfect. You're breaking a bottleneck. doesn't matter how you do it. It's still better. Yeah. But you can't do that long term. So there's four answers for you. I'm I'm okay with the answers because I I would go back and look at root cause. The same thing as lean or continuous improvement. Oh. Why? 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 Why do we have this problem? Why do we have that problem? Why do we have that problem? What's causing that problem? Okay, here we are. I think one of the things you just outlined here is that at some point we might have a people problem and fixing mm -hmm. that is hard. And by the way, I, I think both Jonah and I understand that that's very hard if they share your last name. <laughs> yeah. just, it is what it is man like i can't we can't do anything about that so you may have to do you might have to have a system that works for you and that's the way you do things maybe you stick with excel maybe you go down a different path than everybody else does but regardless it has to work for you and your business and serve your needs that's right yeah. and so the the four answers i just laid out for you they cover the typical scenarios if that makes sense. I mean, the typical scenarios are guys doing residential stuff uh, for homeowners, residential stuff for builders, architectural, yeah. woodworking, commercial, right? Yeah. Um, not really talking about furniture. Furniture is all bespoke stuff. I, I don't know where you're going to oh, get. How very European of you to say bespoke. That's right. For our li listeners in England and Australia, they'll say thank you very much. Well, that's a word. <laughs> it is, but it's way more common in, in Europe, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is where you have, you know, straight up craftsmen and you're never going to do anything even close again. And the best you can do is not that much better than Excel. You know, it might be look a little different, but fundamentally you're just sticking in labor and, and you're manually calculating. There's nothing gonna, you're going to point a picture at well, and have it. For the most part, they don't want to automate either because it is bespoke. It's uh, yeah. custom, custom. Yeah. Yeah, there your, your, your levers you can pull to control your business uh, don't include that part. You, they're going to be more about who's, what's your channel, uh, which work are you going to take. Yeah. yeah. I think this has been very illuminating, very eye-opening. I imagine there's going to be a bunch of software estimating companies out there listening to this, grinding their teeth very hard, but it, it just is what it is. The facts are the facts. And uh, I think... The other thing that you brought to mind, Jonah, today is the perspective that we should all have is there's different types of, uh, of woodwork manufacturing shops. There's residential, there's commercial, and some people are a mix of both. Yes. Um, and then when you're residential, there's another split. And when you're commercial, there's some splits as well. But thinking about yourself in, in a bigger environment helps you understand which solutions to go look for. Yeah, you need to have every system and process in your business aligned towards whatever your goal is right that that's uh now you're talking my language systems process take the unknowns yeah. and the stress out of your day by putting systems and processes in place systematize the routine and humanize the exceptions yeah but they need to be aligned with where you're going i mean you look exactly. at like you know you've got southwest airlines out there and they're a low cost producer that's their thing that's that's their position in the marketplace yeah so everything they do everything is with that in mind. The one question they ask whenever anybody has an idea for a change is, will this make the fares go up or down? And if it's up, it's off the table because that's what they do. And then you look at a full, you know, Delta and, and they're doing, they're transferring luggage between carriers for you and they're serving meals and all that stuff. They're not competing on that same space. And yeah. so they're asking questions that are different. And so you have to do the same. You figure out, what is it that we're good at, that we make money at, that we need to do more of? Yeah. And you find the systems and processes that lend themselves to that. Yeah. Well, thankfully, the people who just heard you say that are the people that listen to this show because that's what we talk about here all the time. Just a couple of, uh, Jonah, just let me get people a couple of different uh, mental tick marks to go through and, and remember. When Jonah's talking about under learning from past jobs and understanding where you make your profits, that's the end of job 
checklist that you guys hear me talk about on this show so much, or as we, we call it sometimes when it's funny talk, we call it the leprechaun report, finding the pot of gold hidden at the end of the rainbow. Uh, earlier, Jonah, you were talking about, you know, go back and the leads you're generating. Well, that's, I mean, that's even in the book that I just wrote, Construction Millionaire Secrets. That's the formula we talk about for building or rebuilding any business. There's only certain levers you can push or pull or ignore in your business. It goes leads times conversion rate equals customers times your average dollar sale times number of transactions equals revenue. And then there's the profit formula under that. There's no magic. You just got to follow the formula. Even if it offends you and makes you angry, the formula is just there to do that. But you have to listen to the process and the formula. And then you talked about, you know, aligning yourself around who your goals and who you are. That's the strategic planning that I keep railing about. Got to have a plan. You got to know where you're going. And that has to reflect who you are as the owner because it's your company, your name probably on the big sign outside and on the side of the vans. It's a reflection of your culture and your vision and your values. And we did all that, Jonah, inside of a software conversation. You're a very wise man. I really appreciate you being on the show. That was a, an excellent overview, I think. Well, thank you. It was fun. Yeah. Well, Jonah, thank you so much. We're approaching the season, the tis the season as it is, as we record this. I don't like to timestamp our episodes because I want them to exist in the future. So that regardless of what time of year you and I are talking, how long has this conversation been relevant in terms of decades? Has it always been relevant? Will it go out of relevance? Where are we sitting on this? It should always be relevant unless you're a software salesman and then you don't want to have this conversation at all. <laughs> you don't want people listening to this. Mm -mm. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Jonah, hey, listen, if somebody has questions or they, maybe they want to consult with you, how do they find you? Yeah, so you can email me. That's the best way. Uh, that's the way that I'll be sure I get back to you when I have some time. So I'm Jonah C, J-O-N-A-H-C, at architecturalarts.com. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. For people listening yeah, to the show, you can also, um, Jonah's episode will be in the show notes on the website. The website, long name. Amazing results, as they say, cabinet maker profit system, or you can just reach me directly. And folks, as I've often said, if you can't find me on the internet, you ain't trying, but uh, I will always get you back to Jonah if that's what you ask for. Um, Jonah, thanks so much. I really appreciate it, man. This has been very, very eye opening. And I think a lot of people out there, a lot of light switches just flicked on all across the world. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Have a great day, Jonah. We'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Bye-bye.